Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for the introduction. Yeah, so my name is Jakub, um, hailing from the University of Cambridge. Um, this work was done as part of my bachelor's thesis under the supervision of Professor Mycroft. Um, without whom I wouldn't be here presenting today because I would never explain what I actually did properly. Well, maybe today I will, we'll see. Um, so today we'll be getting points for free by embedding point array programming in Python, and it'll be a bit of a gimmick. So we have to sort of start with the setup to what we're doing. So Python, it's in the title. Um, it sort of showed up during the discussion today. Um, but the reason I'm doing this is because it is actually where people are doing a lot of array programming in a pretty specific way. And there are some things to, so that probably have to be fixed about it. Um, so where the way you sort of do array programming in Python, you've got NumPy, this name has turned up a lot today. It's not very a very interesting paradigm. To sort of jog your memory, this is how NumPy code tends to look. Um, um, so we've got, you know, shape manipulation, sort of whole array operations, and uh, sort of all the code, all the work gets offloaded to some other language in Python because it is too slow. Um, and what is sort of significant here is that NumPy influenced like a ton of other libraries like PyTorch, Jax, and so on. Um, and essentially all those, like, if I just gave you this snippet, you couldn't really tell me if it's NumPy or is it Jax or, like, those, those libraries essentially work the same. They just have different backends, really. Um, and now, so that begs the question, why is everyone doing it this way? Like, is it really the best way that you can do array programming in every possible use case? Um, I'll call it dubious. Um, the service, so <laughs> hence the title, the original one at least. Um, but sort of, let's sort of ask the question, like, if we could improve it, like, how could we improve it? And how do we sort of get to that point where people are actually using a different style than like NumPy-like, essentially? So sort of let's look at the, p the sides of the different si <laughs> faces of array programming. Um, it's really nice because it is the standard, so everyone uses it, everyone knows it. And the implementations that people actually have got out there are really good, I would say, like XLA. Every one of those libraries somehow is also using XLA. Um, perhaps not an accident. The sort of bad sides are that like from sort of a formalism point of view, it ends up having a lot of primitives. Like if you want to make a type system, you end up having more and more rules, and those rules can be quite unwieldy, except especially with like broadcasting, and it's a bit messy sometimes. In particular, so far, Python still has no sort of st uh, standardized way of typing tensor computations. You just sort of, everyone is trying to come up with a way, but like my bet is that the paradigm just doesn't help. And then we've got the ugly, and this example is just lifted to try and be more objective. Um, from a paper or from an abstract, and well, this is well, this is quite confusing. But there's some transposition going on. There's some messing with uh, uh, shapes. There's a reduction axis introduced that sort of gets summed over, and there's a lot. Of th I think the main problem that you sort of achieve with here is the shape manipulation. Like, there's something that's happening here to perform the right operation. It's perhaps not even obvious to you right now what this operation is, and I think the clear way would be to. Sort of Think like mathematically, like you'd probably write down the summation with an index and like say, oh, this is a matrix which has position ij has this thing in there. Okay, so like, what if we could have you know a programming model where like this is how the code looks, and this is the point for array programming. So sort of the snippet here now is sort of essentially how my calculus for point for array programming that I use throughout looks. This is not something that I've come up with. It's, there's been tons of influences that sort of go in this direction, but essentially point for array code explicitly names its di dimensions and indices instead of just sort of manipulating shapes of arrays. And this is opposed to this you know, point free code where we manipulate shapes instead. We use like combinators and stuff like that. And sort of the key idea here is that it's sort of like arrays as functions, like the array comprehension can be thought of as essentially the lambda abstraction of arrays. And where is this showing up? Like the very initial place you see this, you would think of this is Einstein summation. And indeed, this is how the Python community came about to like sort of these sort of ideas. Um, so this is an example like how you write a matrix product in Einstein summation with in some variation of that notation anyway. In NumPy, so sorry, in Python, people like, in NumPy, there's already been Einsum, which is just slightly generalized Einstein summation for ages. People that weren't really using it, then people started generalizing it because they thought, oh, maybe it's a bit useful. So tensor comprehensions, inops is sort of the thing that actually people are using, like practitioners are using. I don't show inops here, but essentially like, it's like this in some sort of stringly typed mini language. And then you sort of start putting sort of shape manipulation, sort of generalizing that. The problem with that is that you can only generalize strings for so long before you end up with a whole another programming language. So 
what people actually did are quite recently Pascal and others made DEX or published DEX, which is like a whole point for array language with some value dependent types and it's pretty cool, the theory behind it. This is how the initial sort of snippet looks in DEX. So it's quite similar to what you might expect. Um, and I don't go into DEX too much because it's just an example, okay, you can build like a whole programming language around this idea and that's sort of the point here. Um, so there's obviously potential in the theory, like we've got DEX, uh, also here I rely on FSmooth, also SAC has had now tensor comprehensions. So all of these ideas sort of are popping up but people, like actual practitioners, can only use like inops, which is like, oh, just some, you know, it's a string mini language. You can only do so much. But what's really good about it is that it's framework agnostic, so like people across the ecosystem can use it. Uh, so like you can use PyTorch, you can use Jax and so on. And, you know, it would be really nice to like have a pointful array programming ecosystem for Python, but I don't want to be the one to write it. Maybe one of you will, but probably it would be difficult to get anyone to adopt it. So the idea, the approach is to embed a point for array DSL, like a proper one, like a proper nice library with an API, uh, which you can describe as just NumPy, but array comprehensions, and then make a compilation scheme, which will actually take me from this point for DSL into point free array programs. So sort of, oh, I can use, num like it can directly call those existing backends to NumPy-like libraries. And this is sort of the key approach of this project. So, Sort of, and obviously there, there might be some, in case there's still some ambiguity on, you know, is this the best thing to do? Like, does anyone really care about Pointful? Here's a like, practical example of what someone wrote, or what is in <laughs> one of the implementation of a graph attention network, so some attention-based architecture um, from a couple of years ago. So people are implementing these architectures and they end up having to write code like this, which is mostly just noise. Uh, the permutations, good luck saying if, I made a mistake on the second last line, for instance, and I wrote 0312 instead of 0213. Um, I don't think there's a mistake, but why not just write code like this? And this is ein, so ein just says, okay, define me a four-dimensional array, B, H, U, V. Those names have some meaning if you look at the, uh, for the axes, for those indices have meaning if you look at the original implementation, but either way, it becomes much clearer what this is actually doing, what the transpositions are doing, what the broadcasting is doing. And the you know, key fact here is that this is actually producing equivalent JAX code. The original code was JAX. This is also going to produce it. There might be some small differences, but it turns out that performance-wise, it's fine. Um, okay, so let's look at AIN for a bit. What's, so here's a bunch of examples of how you can use AIN. Uh, so basic things, first line, we've got um, defining an array just from numbers from zero to four. Then you know, I can just say, add index I, give me I, and the size is five. Those sort of things. The outer product, the third example, that's sort of just saying, okay, define me a matrix which at index ij has u of i times v of j. All of this stuff and all of this neatly can compile to numpy-like, to calls to a numpy-like library. Um, in this specific case, this is so this is purely functional. So I'm not like, oh, I'm just picking a bunch of AS, Python ASTs and like doing arbitrary things to them. This is like an actually well-behaved deep embedded DSL, uh, which doesn't do weird things. Uh, it's deep embedded, so there's so it's closer to like accelerate, like Haskell accelerate. So uh, you have to introduce values to it and then evaluate them explicitly. So we're sort of working on <laughs> with a colleague. We're working on a different implementation, which will be a bit uh, so sort of e easier to use. But that's sort of future work. Um, in terms of like the sort of types you're working with and combinators are sort of primary here. Uh, you just got vectors. Uh, Ein doesn't have multi-dimensional arrays. The sort of nice thing about the pointful style because you get to index so much, uh, you can essentially just think of multi-dimensional arrays as either scalars or vectors of other arrays. Um, so that sort of simple. So that sort of makes it easier to integrate. Like I don't know, I can have record types now because I can say this vector actually contains pairs of other vectors or something like that. Um, so it becomes convenient to reason that way. And then comp and scalars, which is typical stuff, we don't have rank polymorphism to keep things simple, but I guess you could do stuff, full work like stuff, like from the talks earlier today. The combinators, like, probably draw your attention to the first one. This is just the array comprehension. Given a function which, like, given an index gives you a value, you can get a vector of that value. Um, the trick going on here is that if you don't provide the size, what uh, Ein does for you is infers the size, so that keeps things simpler. There's also fold, which is just an index fold, sort of like a for loop construct, and reduce, which is sort of just added as a proof of concept that this scheme that I'm using generalizes to those sort of combinators. So this is an associative reduction. So these are sort of like full work Sanger or the array combinators. You don't get this sort of stuff in NumPy-like libraries. You just do everything with broadcasting and batching and or batch axes and 
a lot of weird stuff. Um, so quite clean, I think. And this is just a slide to showcase a bunch of other features of the rest. So if headlines, uh, you can execute with a bunch of uh, backends. You can have user-defined classes for your elements, which is not at all what you can do with NumPy. So if I define a class of points, then I can have a vector of those points. Uh, you can have static typing, which reasonably works with the tools people are actually using in, uh, in Python. So this is up to like rank and polymer and those sort of user-defined classes. So it's sort of halfway there. Um, doing shapes is still really difficult. Uh, and there's also ways of integrating with existing framework code. So this isn't like just completely separate, completely independent. Um, so that's about Ein. But now I sort of have to answer the question of how I'm doing the magic of going from sort of this sort of pointful language to a point-free sort of NumPy-like library. So let's start with saying what my source language is. So this is a pretty simple calculus just based on, so fsmooth. So this is something that has been used for devising like essentially pointful array uh, methods for compilation, like for stack al for uh, man memory management, for automatic differentiation. So this is pretty standard. The key thing is we've got array comprehensions indexing, and the sort of weird thing I have in this calculus is I separate out identifiers. I don't just have variables, I also have a separate kind of identifier called an index. So this is denoted with i, j, k, and so on. Um, and yeah, I omitted a bunch of features here, which you just have to believe me, they end up working out. Um, so why did I separate out indices and variables? So one sort of simple motivating example would be to look at whether we have rectangular arrays. I didn't really say, but NumPy only really deal with like rectangular arrays of primitive data types, just to keep things efficient. Uh, but for instance, this expression produces a jagged array, and we have, well, the inner array has a size dependent on the index in sort of the outer array. So this would give us sort of a pyramid shaped array. This is not a great array. Um, so what you can do with, with sort of having a separate kind of identifier for indices, you have a type check, which just keeps track of a separate environment for indices. And whenever you're in a size, you just don't allow sizes to depend on indices. And this sort of makes sense. Like the size of the array cannot depend on which element you're in. And this gives you rectangular arrays. Um, and in fact, this has other nice properties. You actually get regular parallelism in general with the index fold stuff. And uh, you also actually get the compilation scheme. Like the compilation scheme really just derives from this choice. So to sort of get the compilation scheme, I'll try, so the way I sort of derive it is compositional. So I sort of want to have associate for every sub-expression of a phi term, so a phi calculus term, I want to associate some term in a point free language. So we sort of start by thinking, okay, so here's an expression. The equality sign there, don't take it too literally. This is just what the thing evaluates to. But the sort of question I want to be asking is like, this was a program, it didn't have any free variables or free indices. But what if I did have free indices? Like a lot of programs will have free indices and a point free program will not contain any indices, indices at all. So I want to get rid of them. So I need to be able to reason about what happens if there are free indices, what would happen with them. So if I just looked at the part free i plus j, what is this? So from a den denotational standpoint, this would could be seen as like a function where if I give it an assignment to i and j, it tells me some value. But the special thing about indices is that they span over some set range. And I guess the gimmick here is that we have to set what the size is for those indices. So I will say that, okay, i has size two, so it goes zero and one. j goes over, goes over zero, one, and two. And this allows me to actually say, this is sort of like a matrix. It's not really a matrix because it's ambiguous in what way would it be a matrix. But the, all the possible values this expression can take, given the sizes of those indices, uh, is actually can be written down in the matrix. And this matrix has this funny sort of labeled axes, like columns correspond to different values of j, and rows correspond to different values of i. And this sort of lists down all the possible values they can take. And in fact, I could write this matrix in two ways. I could transpose it, but this doesn't really matter. Um, and yeah, the key thing here is that we have to set the index sizes. The way I actually reason about this is I just listen about it symbolically because an index is only bound with one size the moment it's introduced. Um, so we so sort of never mind this, but in the implementation, you just sort of substitute in the right size as defined. Um, so there's a structure here of like these matrices with label axes or arrays with label axes in general. And this sort of leads us to having a compilation scheme which relies on computing these array-like structures. And these structures are called axials. Um, and here's an equation which is a sort of, sort of daunting, I think, a bit. But what it's essentially saying, and 
<laughs> which I sort of try to argue for, it's an intuition or sort of a derivation for saying that if I have a phi term, which sort of needs an assignment to variables and an assignment to indices, and it gives me some value once I give it those assignments, then this is sort of as if I said, okay, this indices should occur in this order. So for instance, there I selected i goes first and j goes first. So i is rows, j is columns. Then it's like a usual assign all variables. And then I get all the possible values of this expression given any assignment to indices. Like, essentially, this is saying I can get rid of all the indices from the expression, um, sort of get rid of all those three indices, uh, and instead compute all the possible assignments to, you know, all the possible values given assignments to indices. And that's sort of the key idea. And th this idea is encapsulated by the axial applicative. And I sort of elaborate how the, you define the axial applicative, but I'll just go with, uh, with an example instead. Uh, so we'll have to say first what the target language is. This is essentially just NumPy, but abstracted. Uh, like a common movement in Python is actually trying to standardize what this interface should be. It's called the Array API. Maybe one day they will succeed, but for now there's five different interfaces, so I had to pick one. Uh, so it's called YAR. Uh, so we've got shape manipulations, we've got some simple constructors, uh, we've got broadcasting element-wise operations, just sort of standard stuff you might expect, but obviously no array comprehensions. Those are pointful. We want point-free program. Um, so the compilation scheme will take give us sort of an interpretation for every phi term. So it will take us from point full to point free. As before, you have to sort of to, to represent stuff in a point free representation because phi has three indices. That will sort of create arrays instead when you have to say, what is this array representation doing exactly? So this semantic equivalence here, this in the middle, is sort of saying, okay, so if I had a phi term initially and it has these three indices pi one through pi k, then the compilation scheme will give me a YAR term, so sort of a point-free array program, which computes all that array of all possible values given any possible assignment to an index. And this essentially uh, is just saying, okay, so like this, also, this essentially gives me this compositionality that like I can bottom-up construct, compile the phi term into a YAR term. Um, yeah. And here the pi is sort of administrative, it's just sort of keeping track of like how am I representing those possible values? How am I representing that array? And I can pick my order myself, this ends up corresponding to the memory layouts depending on how you implement things, but yeah, that's essentially the idea. And I'll try to give a very brief example of this. So let's say the phi term is a of i j i, and we add this to b of i k j. Um, I sort of compile the sub-expressions, which are in this case a of j i and b of i k j, and they get some E prime and E double prime. And they've chosen some orderings for those indices, so I know what sort of arrays I'm getting from those E prime and E double prime. And now the final expression will look something like this. Um, this is obviously also a comparison of how expressive point full can be in comparison to point three, because there's a bunch of administrative work we have to do here. So we have to first transpose the E prime's representation to get a representation in IJ. Then we have to unsqueeze to introduce uh, an axis of size one so that broadcasting works out. So we get something like i1j, and then i1j and ikj can be added together uh, to produce whatever E was computing. And this is, yeah, the, this is really, this ends up corresponding in the axial applicative, which is this pattern which I try to fit in this compilation scheme into. Uh, this ends up corresponding to the lift of the applicative, which is a very fundamental uh, operation to, to the applicative. Um, so yeah, in a way, the Axial exactly encapsulates like this entire compilation scheme because element-wise operations are most of what you're compiling. Um, okay, so we can finish off with some conclusions. Um, first off, these two things are now sort of equivalent. I made the ein code a bit longer, but the NumPy code you've already seen before, so nothing too interesting to see there. The ein code has like fun properties that essentially allow us to program in a more functional way. So I put down some type signatures to maybe make it a bit easier to follow what it's doing, but here I separated out the function for computing the distance between two vectors. So this is the L1 distance, so the sum of absolute distances. And this fun thing here is that in a NumPy-like framework, this would be quite difficult to do it this way because um, what you have to do in NumPy is you have to keep track of the entire array at a time. You, you, if you're, I wrote this function this way, then you'll have to assume that, oh, maybe this array has more axes, maybe it has to broadcast through things, and here, in a pointful style, this sort of gets abstracted away. Here, in the last line, I'm just sort of passing every possible pair of rows of A 
into the function, and everything gets handled through by the compilation scheme. And this is sort of z zero cost in the sense that like it doesn't matter that I made a temporary function here because it's really in a deep embedded DSL. It just sort of works like a macro, so it gets erased at compilation time. We could say, and uh, yeah, in benchmarks it does well on a variety of tests. Um, so these are used in full work and Dex. It's a selection. Also, some cases specific to deep learning, the first two, and this is sort of, yeah, it's within a small constant factor. That's sort of the point here. Uh, where it's faster, this is mostly because I implemented a variety of optimizations. So there's some stuff which is done differently to the baseline, which I had to implement. Uh, but I think generally the goal was to get comparable performance because whether it's better or worse also depends on what backend you're using. Um, <coughs> yeah. And those are essentially those things. You can see the op implementation because it's open sourced and hopefully maybe someone will write a better one at some point because that's what we've got. So here's a new pointful array DSL for Python, the first one which is this general. And axials sort of allow us to take pointful programs. So like these techniques are being developed to point three programs which are things that are actually implemented. And because of this I can imp uh, execute it with different runtimes. So NumPy, Python, Jax, TensorFlow, whatever. And yeah, it's essentially a reconciliation of those different kinds of ideas, both theoretical and practical. And so it's the best of both worlds. So it's sort of, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so that's everything. Thank you for listening and uh, happy to take questions. So you had a you had a graph for targeting NumPy. Do you have similar comparisons with PyTorch and JAX? I didn't run them, but so I did run them in some cases. What tends to happen is that these benchmarks that were used for FUVARC and DAX tend to rely tend to rely on patterns which I didn't optimize properly. Like some, for instance, stencil is something that you would never do in PyTorch, so it doesn't do well because of <laughs> the indexing. Uh, in JAX, it does okay. So it's sort of, I think the comparison is a bit worse because those libraries are so domain specific that some of these operations just don't behave well in them. So for instance, in the if I tested attention in GAT, which is actually like deep learning flavored, which are deep learning flavored benchmarks, those work quite well. Like in fact, they can beat um, the baseline PyTorch because uh, the baseline PyTorch, for instance, uses einsum directly, and einsum does some extra work for with regards to optimization. And this work can be done at compile time in ein instead. So there's some differences that essentially make that sort of comparison a bit subtle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so do you support local LED bindings? Uh, so do you, what do you mean? Uh, so in expressions, do, do you have uh, you know ways of, of of having local names to things? Oh, okay. So the way I handle this is, I think maybe not standard to Python, but I thought it was quite standard. So because the calculus is purely functional, so the phi calculus itself has lead bindings, but when I construct it, I just use a term graph representation. So I make it very simple. And then what I think, the way I think about it is that inserting lead bindings at that point is sort of like common sub-expression elimination. And because of how simple the calculus is, I just do this with dominators. So dominators on a term graph tell you what is the, well, essentially, dominators in a term graph tell you where should I insert a lead binding so that this expression is computed as late as possible and kept for exactly how long it's needed. So it's not done on Python level because that would be quite messy, but there's nothing stopping me from, for instance, here when I reuse A, if A was a result of some more complicated expression, then everything would be handled properly. Like it would eliminate the common sub-expression and it will all be fine. Yeah. And so there's no exponential blow up that can be handled. 